you would stand with us for our first song. Let's put our hands together. In your glorious cast. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray. Your kingdom come, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere. Let's sing together, give us your strength, O oh God. Give us your strength, O oh God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test. By grace we'll preach your gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere. your kingdom Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom
the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then burst time to greet each other. Come on, I know you guys are more awake than that. Good morning. Good morning. You all may have a seat. I want to welcome you all to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody this morning. My name is Aaron, and I serve on the finance team here at the church, and we are just so excited to have you guys attend service this morning. Now, if, if you hadn't noticed, if you take a little peek at your watch, maybe a peek at your phone, a little past 9.30 instead of a little past 10.45. We did start our new summer schedule this morning, so thank you guys for being flexible and going on this journey with us this morning. Um, if you've been following the Facebook posts that the church has been doing about the new summer schedule, you will have seen a number of benefits that we hope that you and your family get to reap from this new schedule, as well as us as a congregation. So we hope that this new schedule will bless you all um, and as we as we start this so thank you once again for your flexibility and speaking of new things that we're starting We are also starting a new sermon series this morning called who's your one so stay tuned for that later on in the service Now I do want to extend a special welcome to our guests whether it's your first time here or You've been checking us out for a couple weeks, and you're still just not sure about who we are Welcome to Crossroads. We want to make sure that you feel welcome here. So we have a guest reception 
that will take place in the lobby immediately following the service. It will be hosted by our very own, the illustrious Pastor Chris, and the elders and some of the staff. It's a fantastic opportunity for you to get to know who we are as a church and to ask any questions that you have and for us to get to know you a little bit better. So I encourage you all to come to that. Again, it's in the lobby immediately following the service. We do have a website that you can go to fill out some information. It's www.guest.gift. You can fill out as much information as you're comfortable with sharing. And we encourage you to fill out the how did you hear about Crossroads question. We want to know, how did you hear about us? So again, welcome to our guests and welcome to everybody else as well. Now, you should have received a program on your way in this morning, and you may be saying, Aaron, I've been coming to Crossroads for a number of years now. I've received this program every Sunday. What's so special about this program? Well, nothing, not this Sunday anyways, but we wanna make sure that you have the information that you need. So, just a couple things to point out. On the front of that program is always some information about some upcoming events that we've got going on here in the life of the church, and we wanna make sure that you know about them and have that information that you need. Also on there are some links to some important information, so check those out as well. On the back side, now you'll see my notes for this morning's welcome, but that's a place for you to take sermon notes, to jot down anything that really inspired you or touched you during the service. Maybe there's some song lyrics that you that, that you uh, heard this morning that you want to be able to jot down and find that song later to listen to, or maybe some scripture or a, a key phrase that Pastor Chris shares in the sermon that you want to meditate on later in the week. It's a great place for you to do that and to take it with you. On that note, on the front of that program, I want to point something out to you. Our growth groups, something that we may more traditionally call Sunday school. On our old schedule, the growth groups met prior to service. Now with our new schedule, they're meeting after the service. So we invite you guys to find a growth group, to join in, and to just really jump into that. There's a couple of groups that are going on right now. There's a group that's doing uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus. The group that I'm in is doing a character study on Elijah, really exciting. And then we've also got a brand new group that's starting that'll meet uh, out in the lobby after service. That's a sermon-based discussion that is led by Brian Ham. So you get to see his beautiful face after the service as well, again, if you wanna join that group. It's a great time to fellowship with other believers and to really dig deep into the scriptures. Um, the growth group that I've been a part of just finished a character study on Ruth. We really like talking about, uh, um, or not Ruth, I'm sorry, Esther. I'm so, I, I promise I was there. I, I was there, I attended. Um, but we just got through talking about Esther. And we've got folks from all different walks of life, different places in their spiritual walks. And it was so great to be able to encourage one another through the scripture and pray for one another in fellowship and just learn from other people who maybe are in a different place than you. So I encourage you to join a growth group afterwards. Finally, you should have received a bookmark on your way in that's got a perforated tear-off spot. Spoiler alert, I have no information about that, other than to tell you that Pastor Chris will let you, more, let you know more about it during his sermon. There's a part that you'll tear off and you'll put in the offering plate during the time that we receive our offering. Whew, thank you for sticking with me. That was a lot to do, get through this morning, but I want to welcome you again once more to our earlier service. I love seeing all of your beautiful faces out there. I know somebody's got some coffee that they brought in to keep awake during the earlier service. I know I've got mine sitting back there with my husband. So thank you once again. Um, I invite you all to bow your heads and pray with me as we prepare our hearts to receive communion. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that we have to come together to worship you as a body of Christ. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to dig into your word, both corporately here in the worship service and then in smaller groups during our growth groups, Father. I pray that you will open our minds and our ears and our hearts to hear what it is that you have to say to us this morning. Father, I also pray for us as we prepare to approach the table, Father, and, and to take communion. Um, convict us in our hearts, Father, of the things that you would have us to repent of and things that we need to think about, Father. I ask all these things in your son's precious and holy name.
if you please stand with us for our next song. And this song is a song for communion. So if you just focus on these lyrics as we sing this next song here.
come to our time of our we'll come to the time of our service where we're going to receive communion. Typically, we do this after the sermon, but today I wanted to front load it. Let's get our hearts right before we go into the message. Uh, how we receive our communion at Crossroads Church is that we're going to invite you to come forward, or actually we have a, a station in the back as well. So if you're in the back, say fourth of the uh, congregation, you may just want to uh, be uh, go through the table at the back. Any baptized believer, any follower of Christ uh, uh, is uh, invited to the table. It's his invitation to you that you would just be reminded of his death, burial, and resurrection on your behalf, that none of us get to heaven on our own. Every one of us are, are invited to the grace of Christ, and I'm thankful for that. And as often as we do this, we remember him. And so I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to uh, stand forward. If you're in this lane, you would actually uh, step out of your left-hand side uh, and come forward and receive the uh, communion. Uh, there are three stations here in the front, uh, and there's a station in the back. Uh, in addition to the Lord's Supper bread that we have that you will tear off, we have some gluten-free bread if that's a necessity for you, and they're on a little uh, plate uh, or on one of the tables that you'll see when you come forward. You can just ask for that. Would you pray with me as we uh, prepare our hearts? Father, thank you for just your incredible love that, uh, Father, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a demonstration of love that is. And Father, as a church, we want to be reminded of that often, that we live by your grace every single day. And the gospel is that, that it's not what we do for you, but what you have done for us, and we merely receive it, accepting the fact that you died for our sin, that you rose from the grave and defeated death, and that now, Father... The, the Son is in heaven preparing a place for all those who love Jesus. So, Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts today as we receive your communion once again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would please stand and, uh, and make your way. If you're unable to move, we do have somebody who will be coming around for those who are seated.
sing together. You've been so, so good to me. Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We wanna see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one, and now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? Certainly a question I want you to start asking yourself. Who's my one? You know, on the front side of your bulletin, this has been here uh, for as long as I've been here, right underneath the date. Would you take a look at it for a moment? Because I want us to read it together out loud. The other day, I tested our staff as we were having staff meeting. I said, what's the vision of our church? And uh, they were able to say a few words that they were familiar with, um, because you'll see this when you walk in, know, grow, and go. Uh, but that's really our, our, our mission of what we're, how we're trying to accomplish. But what is our vision? Right underneath the date, would you read this out loud with me? Impacting the world by making disciples for God's glory, which embedded in this is know and grow and go. At the bottom, you say we're going to know God. You know, in the middle, you're going to make disciples. That's growing together. And uh, impacting the world is going everywhere intentionally. That's what we're about. But... Uh, like so many things, we forget why we exist, why we're even called into uh, a church body. Uh, why did God save us? Uh, what are we doing? You know, so that, that's why I was so uh, compelled to say, yes, I want to uh, partner with, with our convention and focusing on who is your one. Now, I want to ask you a question. What comes to mind, what mental association do you have when I say, what is a Christian? Defining in your mind kind of what is a Christian. Now, let me prime the pump a little bit to get your mind to start thinking about different things. So, uh, what mental associations do you have when I say, what is a politician? Oh, something just popped in your mind. Good, bad, and ugly, you know. All right. Well, what would you say, uh, what is in your mind when I say a CrossFit fanatic? All right, you got something in mind. All right, for some of you, it'll be, this will be different among everybody. What comes to mind when I say the term a millennial? No laughing, no boasting. What comes in your mind when I say the term Star Wars? Aha. Did you have in your mental image some of the newer stuff, or, or did you go back to you know, the, the, the 70s and think about the good stuff? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the original. Yeah, we have these mental associations. What comes to your mind when you think of an Alabama fan? All right, no snickering. What comes in your mind when you think of a Georgia fan? What comes to your mind when you think of a soccer fan here in Atlanta? Yeah, some, some is positive. Some is like, man, they are the craziest people on the planet. Uh, 
So we have mental associations that we connect. I mean, everybody here probably had some mental image in their mind. So when I ask you the question, what comes into mind when I say Christian? You have some thought of what that may be. Some of you may even say, yes, I am a Christian. Some of you may be certain you're not a Christian. Maybe you're open to it, but you, you're not sure uh, yet if you want to become a Christian, but you have in your thoughts what a Christian is. Barna did a research study uh, a few years ago. It revealed that the majority of people outside of the church, those who aren't associated with church or they used to be and now no longer, this is how they think of Christians. 91% of them think of Christians as anti-homosexual. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Some think of judgmental. 87% said judgmental. 85% said they're hypocritical. That was the mental image they had. 78% said they're old-fashioned. Others said they were too political. 72% said they were out of touch with reality. 70% of those who don't go to church said Christians are insensitive to other people. 68% simply said, Christians, they're boring. That's the mental association of what a Christian is in our world. Is there any wonder why uh, churches are not being flocked to and, and Christ isn't being followed? Because whatever they've seen of what they consider Christians, it's not attractive to them. There's nothing about Christianity that seems to, to draw them. And perhaps in, in so many ways, it's not Jesus that they're rejecting, it's the Christianity that's been displayed in our world that they're rejecting. And quite frankly, I reject many of those things too. Did you know that the first Christians, the first followers of Jesus didn't even call themselves Christians? That it wasn't a term that they used for one another. They weren't saying, hey, are you a Christian? I got my Christian bumper sticker. It's not anything that they would even consider. Actually, in reality, the term Christian was only used three times in the Bible. The entire Bible, only three times were Christian used. And, and that was used in a derogatory way. They would look at Christian people and say, oh, you're, you're Christians. You're little Christ. You're running around like Jesus was. Well, we killed him and he's done. So it was always in a negative perspective. You know what Christians actually call themselves? Same thing that Jesus would call them. He called them disciples. 281 times in the New Testament, the term disciple is used. Now, I'm not trying to propose that you're going to throw away the term Christian. You're going to go to work tomorrow and say, hey, I'm no longer a Christian. That's not necessarily my point. What I'm saying is that sometimes our words and our definitions get so slanted that perhaps we ought to go back to being familiar with God, what God has called us to. And he's called us to be disciples. So perhaps we need to understand what a disciple is. A disciple is a follower of Christ. Someone who wants to learn from Christ, become like Christ. Let me give you some, some examples. A disciple is one who follows a teacher so closely that he becomes just like his teacher. So the concept, the, the word disciple actually will expose the fact that many who claim to be Christians are not actually disciples of Jesus. They just have a label that they've attached to themselves. Today I want us to be in the text of Matthew chapter 4. If you've got a Bible with you, pick that up. Matthew chapter 4, we're only going to look at a few verses, at verse 18 through 22. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. We have a red Bible in the pew rack right in front of you. And you can turn to page 809. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and following, let me just read this section in its entirety for us. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending the nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and follow him. 
Now, that's an amazing story. But do you find it a little odd? These fishermen, rugged fishermen, are out there fishing. Some guy in a robe comes up to them and says, Hey, leave it all, follow me. And they immediately followed. Now, if someone showed up, uh, Andre, if somebody showed up, you're out there doing your, your work, and, uh, and some guy in a robe just comes up to you and says, hey, Andre, drop it, let's go, let's follow. You don't know him, would you just leave your employment right there? Seems a little odd. How many of you, if some guy knocked in your door and said, hey, I'm, I'm here for you, let's go. There was no pre-warning, you don't really know the guy very well. Maybe you've heard of him, but this guy calls you away. That's odd to me. It's almost like, you know, go back to a Star Wars illustration. It's like he did some kind of, you know, Jedi mind trick. Come follow me. Yes, we will follow you. No, no, that's not it at all. You know, sometimes when you read the scripture, you got to read a little slower and put yourself in the sandals of the people in the story and go, would I do that? Some just guy walks up to me. Yeah, I just follow everybody. Don't you teach your children not to follow strangers? They just come up and say, follow me. Oh, yeah, come on, let's go. Oh, yeah, well, why not? No, no, that's unusual. So to understand why they did what they did, you have to understand the, the background, the historical background of this. And sometimes I know we reject history and, and, and kind of the, the, the boring stuff we think, but in reality, it gives you a better perspective of what's happening here. Every, these boys, uh, these, uh, the fishermen were Jewish. Every Jewish boy at the age of five went through Torah school. Every one of them. They got to Torah school, and what the Torah is, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, you know, Genesis uh, through Deuteronomy. And they would learn it. They would memorize it. In reality, the, the first uh, uh, couple of days of, of class, is my understanding, is the boys would get there, and many of them came out of very poor homes, and so they would put honey on their tongue as they read the book of Genesis to them. First time those boys had ever tasted something sweet. And if you'll listen as we read, we'll give you more of it. Oh, give me some more of that. You understand? Kind of, you know, encourage some of you teachers that have worked with children. If I'll just give you a piece of candy, you'll listen to me. Danny is the master of that, by the way, I've heard. Is Danny in here? He's on our security team, so maybe you step down. So they would give them that. So the, these Hebrew boys would, would go to Torah school. They'd learn the fi first five books of the, uh, of the, of the Old Testament. And they would get to taste the, the honey. They would do this for five years. By the time they were age 10, those boys knew the Torah. But the best students, of top, maybe top 20% of those students, got to advance and continue on in the school where the rest of them, the 80%, were said, you really didn't make the cut. You didn't really understand it. We don't see a lot of um, worth in you to advance. So therefore, you go back to your families and you learn the profession of your family, fisherman, tax collector, whatever that may be. And so it got down to just a few. Well, by the time they reached age 17, the boys who continued on to the school, there was another cut. And if they wanted to go on and make a career out of the religious studies, your next step would be to find a rabbi, meaning teacher, that you admired and, and apply to become the rabbi's Talmud, a Hebrew disciple. Now, I want you to get a perspective of this. In, in our generation, if we said, all right, let's put all of our children in, in like a Christian school. They'll learn all of this. By the time they're 10, we'll see if they make it, and then we'll cut some of them out. Listen to me. There was a huge desire among every family and every child because this was the greatest profession on the planet, to be in the religious um, sect, to be able to follow God. I mean, there was no basketball and, and rock stars that they were trying to follow. This was the top. And so you wanted to be in the last few percent, where most of them did not. But if you made it, you would run after a rabbi and be his, his, his Talmud, his, his disciple. And when you found one, you would go and you would sit at his feet requesting to learn. Well, that rabbi would examine that, that young man. He would question him to see if, if he was worthy to be his disciple. And rabbis did not always accept those who applied. These rabbis would, would choose the smartest, the most talented to be their disciples. They also chose young men they believed would become just like them. 
not just to know what they know, but to do what they do, to take on the same mannerisms, to answer in the same way. They were making mini-me's, if you will. I want somebody I see so, so moldable that they'll become just like me. And they rejected most. The highest compliment you could give to a Talmud in that day was his dust gets all over you. Meaning as that rabbi would walk, you were so close that the dust that he would stir up would get all over you and you would you begin to, to smell like he smells. You'd begin to walk like he walks. Everything about you mimics who he is. Now in Jesus' day, there was really a rare form of a rabbi. Not all rabbis reached this level, but there was a rare form of rabbi who possessed a characteristic that the Jewish people called uh, um, a shmiha. Did you learn shmiha? A shmiha. Would you say that's kind of a fun word to say? Shmiha. Shmiha is Hebrew for authority. So when a rabbi had an incredible sense of the scriptures. They had a command of it, a masterful command of it, that they were able to give insights and say this particular phrase, you've heard it said, but I say to you, that means they had shmiha, they had an authority that people listened to. And, and based on historical records, there was only about 12 individuals, 12 rabbis that ever reached to the level of shmiha in the first century. So when someone in your presence was the, the, the shmiha, the authority rabbi, you gave them, listen. You, you, you watched. You wanted to know what they had to say. To be regarded as a rabbi with shmiha, there, was, uh, an there had to be incredible evidence that you could perform a miracle. Shmiha had to be officially conferred on you by two other rabbis also with shmiha, which they didn't give very often. This was a very exclusive club. Now, I want you to go back to, to Matthew chapter 4 and understand. When Jesus walks up to these young men, this was the Jesus that at 12 years old, when he was in the temple, the religious scribes were sitting around this young 12-year-old. Why? Because he had extra insight and authority. He had some shmiha all over him. You know, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, just a few chapters from this, where Jesus would frequently say, you have heard it said, but I say to you, he says in this particular verse, in chapter uh, 7, verse 28, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had shmiha, one who had authority, and not as the typical scribes or Pharisees. In Luke chapter 20, verse 2, the, uh, the, uh, the chief priest and the, and the scribes said to him, Tell us by which shmiha, tell us by which authority you, you speak these things. And who is it that gave you this shmiha? The person who had to give it to him had to be someone who also had shmiha. You know, and Jesus had in two different places in the New Testament, he didn't necessarily need human authority. He got God's authority. God spoke to him at his baptism. This is my son whom I am well pleased. What greater commendation and re, you know, review could you get than that? So in considering this, when he walks up to these fishermen, he wasn't just some guy who said, why don't you leave fishing, you know, fishing and follow me? They knew, based on his own presence, this was a shmiha. Now I want you to notice in the text, but look at verse 18. This is where I, I'm going to take you into a few places here in this, this chapter. In verse 18, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. I want you to notice here that Jesus, this new rabbi with Shmiha, chooses Peter and Andrew, and the fact that they were fishermen shows you what? They didn't make the cut. Out by 10 years old, and he's walking up to Here's the first thing I want you to notice. That Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. When he's calling people to himself, he doesn't go after those who made the cut, those who have proved themselves, those that had all kinds of ability. He goes to those 
who are merely willing to receive and to follow. They were the B team. I want you to let that sink in for a second. When Jesus chooses his squad to build his movement, he chose the B team. So, of course, when they heard the call, they immediately went. I want you to imagine if, if perhaps you, you have some sport that you really like or there's some profession you want, you know, and, and you're not quite there and maybe you, you've tried out and you've been cut from the team. You never even made it to the practice squad. I mean, it, it just never was good. Maybe you've tried out for some kind of position and they continue to drop you off. But then the owner of the company, the, the, the coach of the team, walks up to you at a, a local Starbucks or sees you in line at Walmart and he walks up and says, hey, I want you to be on the team. Come on. You notice he's not calling you because of your ability, just because he wants you. Just because she wants you. It has nothing to do with your ability. God doesn't go after those who have all kinds of ability. He just goes after those who have some available. He doesn't call the equipped. He always equips the call. I love how here when, when Peter and Andrew are being selected and there have others that are come along, it has nothing to do with how great they are. It has to do with how great he is and what he can do through them. I think we need to stop giving our excuses of why we're not involved in God's mission. Too many times you say, well, what can I do? I mean, I'm nobody. I didn't make the team. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't do all these things. And, and, and it's not that question at all. If you consider what Jesus did with Peter and Andrew, they had been cut out of uh, seminary school. They weren't making it. They were just fishermen. And God just walks up to them and says, but it has nothing to do with all of that. It has to do with what I can do through you. So stop asking what you can do and just start asking what I can do through you if you are willing and available. What a powerful call to our lives. We give excuses. We look down upon what is possible because we only look in the mirror. When God has never called us to look in the mirror to see what we can provide, he only asks us to look at him to see what he can do. Remember when Peter was walking on the water, and it was all cool when he was walking on the water with Jesus, but eventually he focused off of Jesus and onto the winds and the waves? Was it because he now doubted Christ's ability? No. He all of a sudden started looking at his ability. I can't do this anymore, and I'm sinking. It's when we start focusing on what we can do that we sink, but when we remember what he can do and what he can do through us, that we will rise. This man with authority, the Shmiha, he goes to them, and he chooses them, not because they're the best. I like what John MacArthur said. He said, God skipped all the wise on this day. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were all in Rome. He, he passed over Herodotus, the historian, the, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar. He chose men so ordinary, it was comical, MacArthur said. No rabbis, no teachers, no religious experts. That wasn't his pursuit. Half of these men were fishermen. One was an IRS agent. One was a former terrorist that he added to the group. Jesus chose these B-team players because his work in the world wouldn't come from their abilities for him. It would only come through his abilities through them. People with a lot of talent and a lot of ability will only get in the way if they don't understand the power only comes from God. In Matthew eleven eleven, it says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, that's pretty much everybody. I don't think anybody got here outside of, you know, that. But Jesus was saying, he was speaking of his, his uh, uh, most uh, focused person, somebody he loved dearly. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, among uh, all those who are born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus loved John the Baptist. That was his cousin, and he thought he was fantastic. What John the Baptist was doing was, was top. But when then he adds this other phrase right after it. I want you to tune in for a second. He says, Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 
John the Baptist was top. But someone who can be greater than that is the one who is least in the heaven. The one who can't bring anything to the table other than his life and donated completely to God where God will transform it and do it. And I just wonder in this congregation if anybody ever feels like you're the least in the kingdom of heaven. Not because you're thinking you're the top, because you're just like, God can never use me. I don't know enough. I can't do enough. I, I, I can't sing. I can't preach. I can't, I can't do anything. I, 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 I've never been on a foreign soil to be a missionary. I just do my thing. You know, I, I barely make it financially. I'm just trying to survive. And you might think you're the least in the kingdom. Let me tell you, you're in a good position if you're a humble, willing lover of God to do what he calls you to do. It's not about your ability. It's about your availability. The second thing I want you to notice, he says in verse 9, he says, follow me. He's going to create them to them, but follow me. You know, the normal way to be a con to, uh, connected to a rabbi, I told you, was that you had to be the top of your class and you had to pursue the rabbi, and the rabbi would determine if, he, if you were worthy of his attention and, and, uh, and time. And many times they would just push them away. It's not, you're not good enough. This rabbi doesn't wait for you to come to him. This rabbi pursues those he desires. This is one of the truths of this passage, is this. He chose us, not we him. This is a rabbi who's coming after you. It has nothing to do with your heart for him. It has his heart for you. He comes to Peter and these other gentlemen because he chose them. Jesus flipped the entire process. No one came to sit at Jesus' feet. Jesus came seeking them when they weren't even looking for him. Jesus came seeking when they didn't really have any idea that they could be worthy of being a disciple. Do you understand what kind of confidence that would give to these disciples? That it had nothing to do with their ability, it had nothing to do with anything that they could provide, that they were chosen based on his grace, not on what they could bring because if you were thinking what I could bring you'd always be worried I, I, do I have enough have I done enough have I said the right things I don't know I, I don't know if I can keep this up and when you are received into Christ it has nothing to do with what you've done it's everything about what he has done he's chosen you one of the things you see in the New Testament is how many times Jesus and the apostles bring up the concept that he chose us as a means of instilling uh, or, or, or a means of instilling confidence in him in a world you may feel overwhelmed by a position but you can be confident that if God chose you he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion listen if you're Jesus disciples then he chose you to be a disciple in John chapter 15, verse 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. He chose you, not simply for forgiveness. He chose you so that you would in turn be his, his, uh, 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 his disciple, his follower, and to do what he calls you to do, to smell like him, to pick up all the dust all over you that he, he's, he's putting out there. And when we realize that God is greater in, he, uh, in us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world that we go against, that we have full confidence in him. Some of you may be struggling right now in some of the areas that you find yourself, employment or your marriage or your relationships. I want you to understand that the God who is in you when you trust in Christ is the God who can overcome any challenge that you face. And it has nothing to do with your ability. You might be married and say, only God could really work this out because I don't have the ability. That's a good perspective, by the way, that you don't have the ability, but God in you does. And he'll help you overcome. And, and he'll transform you and he'll fix the situation. You may have lost confidence in a, a lot of things, but understand that God has not lost one ounce of his power. And our best position typically is in our weakness where he shows his strength. 
Here's the third thing I want you to see in the passage. When he said to, to follow him, uh, you know, follow me, I think it, this is it. Our primary calling is to be with him. He doesn't call us to be disciples so that we can just do some things in this world. His, our primary calling is so that we know that we're going to become like him, so we have to get to know him. He's saying, draw close. Follow me so you get to know who I am. I already know you in and out. I know more about you than you know about yourself. And I still love you. Now, get to know me. He's telling them to follow me, and, and, and they're not, they're not going to be put out on mission immediately. They're, they're three years until Jesus will die on the cross and, and, uh, and ascend to heaven. So he's going to draw them close and show who, them who he is. He didn't tell them all that he was going to assign them to. Because his primary call wasn't to do something, it was to be someone, to become like him. How do you get to know Jesus? How do you get to know who he really is? Well, I'm holding the greatest book on the planet that has taught me everything I know so far about Jesus. And I don't understand everything about the book that's in front of me. I just know that everything I do know has come from here in the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit who, who shows me who Jesus is. I've seen his miracles. I've seen his forgiveness. I've seen his grace. I, I've seen his calling. I, I've seen some power. And I just know that Jesus is the Son of God because he has proven it. And by the way, this Bible is historically accurate, and it's been for 2,000 years. People have tried to destroy it. People have tried to say, well, it, it's not good anymore. And those people have come and gone, died away, and the Bible's still living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will cut through your heart. You ought to spend more time in it. If you want to get to know Jesus, then start reading his word. I'll, I'll give a Bible to an unbeliever, and you say, well, how are they going to understand it? I just trust the Spirit of God will explain it. And I'm here to answer any questions that individual may have. And sometimes individuals come to me and ask me, and go, I don't know. But I know a lot of other things about it, and, and, and what I don't know, I'll just trust him who wrote it, and he'll take care of helping us understand it. Some people say, I can't become a Christian until I understand it all. I said, you've got a long ways to come because we see through a glass kind of dimly. There are some things I'll never understand this side of heaven, but I'll trust the, the, the God who sent a Savior to die for my sins, rose from the grave, went to heaven, and called me to himself so that I could become his disciple. Here's two other things I want you to see in the passage. First, or the, the first thing I'll show you is that to follow him, you have to to leave all. You notice in the text, it says immediately that they left their nets and they followed him. And, and going on from there, there he saw the other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and, the, and in the boat of Zebedee, their father, and mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. What I see in that passage is they were willing to give up the most important things in their life. First, their boat. That was their career. All that, that they, they, they learned and, and did and what took care of their needs. We find our security sometimes in our employment. If I can just be employed, then I'm good. They walked away from the security of their employment. And then they walked away from their father. The most significant relationship that they had. The security of family. Now, for most of us, we typically don't abandon our employment or our family because God doesn't necessarily call us to, but the question is, would we be willing to? I know enough, uh, personally, uh, Muslims and those uh, 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 that I've heard stories of that when they come to Christ, they literally give up everything to follow him if they're in a foreign country. To confess the name of Christ when you're a Muslim in a Muslim country, to say, I'm going to follow him, it could mean death, even by your own family killing you because you have left their faith. So it's a significant thing to say, I trust Jesus because it's not something that will be embraced. Now in our culture, we don't typically have those kind of extremes, but would you be willing to give it all up and say that Jesus is the one I follow, whatever the cost? Here's the last thing is he commands us to spiritually reproduce. He doesn't just show the calling. He calls 
us to an actual mission. I love this phrase. Follow me, he told them, that I will make you fishers of men. Just like Jesus was a fisher of men, he was going to make them the same way, that they were going to reach out with the gospel and call them to Jesus. This was an essential part of being a disciple. That the invitation to relation with Jesus was also the commission to go and do what he does, to be a part of all that process. How do you prove that you're a disciple? It started the, the, the morning of, you know, am I a Christian? Well, that was a derogatory term, but okay, we can understand what a concept of a Christian, but a disciple is truly one who follows, and it's not an A-level Christian. It just means a Christian. Someone who is a follower of Christ is one who is a Christian. If we're not following him, if we're not you know, being discipled, if we're not discipling others, we are lacking a, a huge element of what Christianity is all about. Listen to what Jesus said when he says this in John chapter 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciple. How many of you'd want to approve? To prove that you're a disciple. Well, how do you do that according to this text? You're going to start bearing some fruit. What is that fruit? That you're going to be sharing the gospel message and seeing the fruit. Now, only God can change a heart. We are not responsible for how people respond, but we certainly are proving that we're following by doing what he does. And what does he do? He calls people to himself, and we likewise will call people to him. This fruit of making disciples, as Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20 tells us, we're going to make disciples as, as we are going. We're going to baptize and teach. But the whole verb in that passage in Matthew chapter 28 is make disciples, and the participles are go, baptize, and teach. That's the process, but the reality is we're making disciples, impacting the world by multiplying disciples for God's glory. Jesus summarized his ministry in, John, or in Luke chapter 19 when he said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. When you came in this morning, you were given a bookmark. And this bookmark, I want you to pull it out just for a moment because you can begin to prepare that. The bookmark has um, different daily uh, scriptures that you can read, and it correlates with the uh, devotional book that I encourage you to pick up that's in the back table when you walk out. June 1st through June 30th, I'd encourage you to read it every day. And these, these little um, verses will, will help you to understand how you can pray for one person that you desire to come to know Christ, one person that you personally know that you would like to invest in. This investment might be a week, it might be a month, it might be 10 years. It's not a program, it's a passion that God has for us. We ought to have somebody in our, name, in our heart, in our mind, a name that we're always praying for all the time until we die. And when God gives us the fruit of that salvation that someone comes to faith that we've loved on, we continue to love as we disciple them, then God gives us another name that we're going to continue to pray for and see how they come through, how God transforms their heart. But prayer and intentionality of conversation, God will use that. So I'm going to encourage you to do this. You can rip off that portion at the top. You can write a name on there. If God has already given you a name, maybe it's more than one name, but I, I would love for at least one name that you could put on there. You can put the name on your card, and you put the name on the bookmark. The name on the bookmark is for you. The name on the card is for me, where I begin to pray with you for that person. We'll put it on our prayer list so that people in the prayer meeting on Wednesday night can also uh, join us in praying for that individual. If you'd be so bold, you'd put their name, and then somewhere on there also put your name so we'd know that it's you praying for that individual. And I'm going to encourage you at the end of our service in just a few moments that you would write that name and you would place that in the offering bag. And some of you might say, well, I don't really have a name right now or I, I hadn't really given it much thought. Fine, keep the card. Pray this week that God would give you a name. It might be a family member. It might be somebody in your own home. It might be somebody that's hanging out with somebody from your home. It might be uh, the person across the street. We've got brand new neighbors across the street I'm already praying for. I got a guy that lives next door to me. It used to be George. George moved out. I was praying for him, but the Lord just took him uh, back to Greece. So we've got a new neighbor trying to, uh, trying to figure out how to connect with him. He's a little quiet. We've got some new neighbors across the street that aren't believers in Christ. So I'm praying for them. And there's some others. Who is it that the Lord has put in your path specifically that you might seek and save that which is lost? And you put those in there. He commands us to spiritually reproduce. 
In the Master Plan for Evangelism, Robert Coleman, one of the, uh, a great book and something that shaped my mind years ago, he says this, when all the church learns this lesson, preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism, nor it can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christians, for Christian workers do the job. No, individual women and men are God's method. God's plan for discipleship is not something, but it is someone. God's plan to reach the world is through you individually connecting with individuals in your world. So what is God's method of evangelism and making disciples? Here, you are. You are God's method. I want to see every one of you over the next year or two where you would become a growing disciple that has the privilege of seeing more disciples made by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everyone at Crossroads I would desire would, would step into this place knowing that they've prayed and they're seeking the fruit that only God can bring. And that's our emphasis. I told you just a few months ago about a thousand day journey of of making the culture around here more discipleship focused. And that doesn't mean just internally, it means externally. Would you join me in a word of prayer? And then I've got a few other words to say as I'll prepare our ushers to receive our offering. Father, thank you for just your word that communicates to us the, the shmiha, the, the authority that Jesus had when he called the lowly, those, those smelly fishermen to your kingdom, those who didn't make the cut according to the world standards, but they certainly were a part of your agenda. I pray that we would be helped by the Spirit to know that even in the least of the kingdom, we can be greater than John the Baptist if we would just be humble and willing to follow you. I want to be your disciple, not just something labeled a Christian. I pray, Father, in the hearts of everyone here today that they would understand who you have placed in their life intentionally so that they could be used by your power and through your words to reach other people. Convict us. Help us. And I pray that the fruit would give you the glory, so proving that we are disciples. So in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let me say a few words before we'll, we'll sing our final song. In a moment, we're going to receive our offering, and, and, uh, and we're going to, you can take time to complete that if you, you need to, the information. Our usher will come around in just a few moments. You can drop it off into an offering bag that we'll pass around, along with your one, uh, who's, one, uh, who's your one card. If you're a first-time guest, let me remind you, as Aaron told you, I'm going to be uh, out in the, the lobby over on the couch side. It's over to the left when you're walking out. A few of our elders will be there. Love to just have a chance to meet you. It'll just be a few moments, and, uh, and you can be able to take off or join one of our, our growth group classes, and we've got a new, new one starting today. Now, as our ushers are taking their places now, uh, I just want to remind you that uh, Crossroads is a member-supported ministry. Everything that we do is according to the generous offerings that you give. If you're not prepared to give today, that's quite all right. That, uh, you can always go online, uh, www.crossroads.gift. So, yeah, if all the ushers would take their place so we can receive it in a, a fairly uh, quick fashion. Now, if you found today's message helpful, let me encourage you to bring somebody back next week. Uh, this is always a place we ought to be inviting people to because it's inviting them to God. It's also inviting them to a relationship with the people here. It's good. Now, if you haven't uh, yet joined a growth group, consider joining one today. Uh, growth groups are typically about 6 to 20 people that you can get to know. the love on you. You don't have to know a lot. You just need to know that you can be loved a lot. And that's a big part of our, our church. Now, now when the offering, uh, uh, no, we'll begin to receive the offering. You can guys go ahead um, doing that. Just take a few moments there. If you ever have any questions about anything I've said, you, you ever need any prayer, just any of those type of things, I want you to seek me out. Typically, I'll be in the back uh, today. I certainly will be around there at the couch side. Uh, I just make myself available to you. Our elders will do so as well. One of the things, too, uh, let me uh, ask of you, is that uh, if you'd be willing to help us on Sunday morning, 
We had a great team this morning serving, and I'd love to have a rotation of that. People who want to stand next to the refreshment table just to be a smiling face and assist making sure things are stocked. The uh, second thing you can do, uh, open the doors for people when they're coming in, or you can pass out a bulletin. And there are several other things, like receiving the offering today, or you, you can even help the guys upstairs if you're technologically savvy. You know anything about uh, audio or visual. So you can be a part of that. Now, would you please stand with me? It's been a great day to be together. I want you to pray, or not pray, but sing with us, and then uh, we'll dismiss. And as we dismiss, why don't you uh, shake a few hands of people you haven't quite seen today or you don't even know. All right? Thanks. If you would join us in singing the last song, which is Let Your Kingdom Come, we're going to sing the chorus one last time. Come. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth, till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth, till your sovereign work on earth. Let your kingdom come. Thank you, everyone, and have a blessed week.